So uh, good evening in the US and good morning in Australia. Um, this, I just want to really uh, quick um, to explain what is the session about. We invited two guests from the US to talk about how the US health system is financed and looked at the strengths and weaknesses and also explore the challenges that ahead of them. And also, hopefully, we can uh, draw on the experience in the, Austra in, Aus in the Australian health system to see what we can learn from them based on the differences and also um, the, the health outcomes as a result of how the system is organized and financed. So now, these subjects were originally recorded for uh, this interview, or, or originally recorded for the postgraduate subject, uh, health economics um, organized by James Cook University. However, we will make it publicly available so that people can learn from uh, our guests. And um, the first half an hour will be um, a PowerPoint presentation. And then there will be about 20 minutes uh, for interactive questions and answers. And we have some discussion as well. So let's just go around the table to introduce ourselves. I'll start from myself. And I'm, I'm um, Associate Professor Jen Ming Nan. Um, I'm also the uh, research, uh, Associate in Research Education at the College of Public Health and Medical and uh, Veteran Science, James Cook University. And Chris? Oh, hi. hi, everyone. I'm Chris Rowan, and I'm a health economist at James Cook University, um, where I teach public health economics. And I also help coordinate research for nursing and midwifery. Professor Zhao? Yes, my name is Dr. Mei Zhao and I'm a professor of health economics here at the University of North Florida. I'm, all, uh, I'm also a chair of the Department of Health Administration. Very nice to meet you guys. And uh, greetings from Florida. I'm uh, Dr. Sean Periani. I'm a physician, radiation oncologist, and now I am the director of the executive master's in health administration program at the University of North Florida with Dr. Zhao. So pleasure to be here. Welcome everyone. And I leave the time for you, uh, Dr. Zhao. Yes. Dr. Perrin, you want to share the screen? So uh, we're going to talk today about the US health financing system. Uh, and so just to let you know where we're from, we're from Florida uh, and the northern part of Florida, we're University of North Florida. And this is our uh, illustrious fac faculty on our campus. Uh, and you're, you're having our best person here, which is our leader, Dr. Mei Zhao here with us today, uh, along with myself, uh, Dr. Sean Periani. So we're glad to be here. So we're going to cover uh, in the next few minutes, the US healthcare system, the health financing in the US, and some advantages and disadvantages of our system, as well as some challenges and opportunities. And there are many of those uh, here. So the US system, uh, like when you look at any healthcare system is complicated, right? It, there's a lot of parts to it. Uh, so it starts with all the facilities that we have, hospitals, uh, nursing homes, uh, ambulatory surgery centers, doctor's offices uh, that provide services uh, with, the, with, the, with the workforce. Uh, and then uh, we have, you know, we'll provide services to the patients, but we also have some unique um, uh, systems uh, uh, in, our, in our healthcare uh, arena that, that we can talk about. Uh, first is our, we purchase a lot of um, um, healthcare services external to the system, i.e. through the pharmaceuticals, durable medical equipment, lots of equipment and technology. So we're very technology driven here. So that's a very big cost and, and part of our healthcare system. Uh, also, we have an educational research uh, arm here of, of our healthcare system uh, conducted at academic medical centers like ourselves and other universities. Uh, and then, um, as I mentioned, the healthcare providers are in many ways different uh, than many other healthcare systems because they're not direct employees of either the hospitals or the healthcare system. Some are, but that's uh, a, a, a portion of it. Uh, uh, there's also a large portion that is independent or contracted with hospitals or has hospital privileges. Um, and then when we look at financing, which we're gonna talk about uh, in much more detail, we have uh, government financing, private insurance and out-of-pocket. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail here. So, so basically, if you look at uh, healthcare coverage, 
of our uh, population, we have a population of about 330 million. So this is in millions here. Uh, and a majority of those patients are actually covered by what we call non-institutional uh, coverage or private care coverage. Um, M Medicare is our government uh, coverage, uh, very similar to your Medicare. And then we also have a small portion of the military that's covered by the government. So when you look at the non-institutional care, which is really the majority of healthcare coverage, uh, of that, the majority is provided by employers. The employers actually provide healthcare coverage for our, uh, our um, uh, constituents or, or citizens of uh, the United States. Uh, there is also some other coverage, which I'll talk about in, in just a minute. And then unfortunately, we have about 10% that don't have any insurance at all, or either self-pay or not able to, to access any kind of health plan uh, uh, that is available to them. Um, so of this other coverage, we have a, a significant portion that is Medicaid uh, or Children's Health Insurance Program this is for children and uh, indigent population who are not able to afford uh, uh, healthcare coverage either uh, on their own or don't have employment coverage. Uh, and then we have a group of uh, um, you know, consumers that uh, really are not able to qualify into any of these buckets. And so we came up with this uh, Affordable Care Act, which was under President Obama, also called Obamacare. And that provides for a significant portion of uh, coverage of the other, other category. Okay, thank you, Dr. Periani. There are three major methods of financing in the United States, like we mentioned. The first one is out-of-pocket payments by consumers. This includes the insured population's payment for deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, and the payments for service services not covered by the health insurance programs. Another big part is the uninsured population. If they want to go to see doctor, if they want to go to hospitals, they have to pay themselves. Another big part is the insurance premiums. This paid directly by the consumer, mainly through their employer or by governments like Medicare, Medicaid, or military, or by a combination of both public and private. And the third one, of course, is tax. So it's easy to understand. Well, exactly in 2019, out of the total almost $3.8 trillion spent on healthcare in the United States, about 10.7% was financed out of pocket by patients themselves. And another 31.5% was financed through private health insurance mainly through their employers. And almost 58% was financed through public programs like Medicare, Medicaid, public health programs. On average, each American spent $11,582 in 2019. We all know that the healthcare data in this country is always like two years later. So today is 2021, so we could only get the 2019 data. I'm sure this per capita spending on healthcare would be much higher in 2020. We all know what happened and in 2021 because of the pandemic. So on average, the United States spent 17.7% of the GDP on healthcare. So to give you an idea, this link showed that the comparable country average is only about 11%. Australia in 2019 spent only 9% of G your GDP on healthcare. So it's about half of your GDP compared to the US. Well, we kept uh, talking about the employer sponsored health insurance. So because this is the biggest part of the private health insurance here at the U United States. The premiums, one reason why employers love to provide health insurance for their employees, especially for the big employers, is that because the premiums paid through employer do not need to pay tax. Well, if the employers pay this part of money as a salary or wage to their employees, both employers and employees have to pay tax. But if it's paid as 
insurance premium, no party needs to pay uh, tax. This means there's a huge public subsidy. The government is giving up the tax from the employers and the employees to encourage the employers to provide health insurance for their employees. And taxes are lower than if premiums were taxed at the same rate as wage or salary. Employees bear a major share of premium costs through lower direct wages. Of course, employers are not stupid. They do not want to give you high salary at the same time, you know, uh, provide health insurance. It has to be part of your package. Well, let's take a look at how the average annual premiums for single and family coverage over the past 21 years. Take a look at in 2000, the family coverage annual uh, premium was about $6,438. And then after 10 years in 2010, this number doubled, more than doubled, became 13,770. And after another 10 years, well, fortunately this time it has not doubled yet, but it's already more than $21,000 for a family. You might say, oh, Dr. Zhao, you and Dr. Perani have to pay that much for your family? Well, not exactly, because remember, a big part of that will be paid by our employers. So for example, out of the almost 21, uh, more than $21,000, I have to pay about $2,500 for my family. And the rest, UNF, my university will pay for me. Well, we know there are a lot of type of uh, a lot of types of health plans in this country. The conventional one, if you look at the the top one, used to be very popular, and now almost none none of the health insurance private health insurance plan belong to the conventional one. The POS, the point of service one, also reduced significantly. HMOs reduced significantly. PPOs pretty stable, but also reduces significantly. The big part that we see increasing over the past 14 years since 2006 was the high deductible health plan with the savings option, we call it HDHP. If you look at now, all, more than 31% of the employers are offering this HDHP. The purpose of the high deductible health plan is try to use a lower premium, but high deductible to, um, to lower the cost and also try to uh, incentivize the consumer driven health plan. Well, public finance and healthcare, like we mentioned, Medicare is mainly for the elderly people. Um, 65 years and older. Medicaid is mainly for the low income families. So for Medicare, Medicare in the United States has four parts, part A, part B, part C, part D. So part A is for the hospital services and other facility services. Part B is for physician services and other professional services. Part D is for prescription drugs. Well, part C, in fact, it's not a specific part, it's just Medicare allows their beneficiaries to enroll in the Medicare Advantage plan called Medicare Part C. So Medicare Part A, if you work in this country for 10 years and you could earn 10, um, 40 credits, you're gonna get pay the payroll tax. So this part, 2.9% of the wages every year will paid by both you and your employer, each pay 1.45%. So that's part A. And part B, you have to uh, pay a monthly premium. Part D, the same thing. So individuals earning higher incomes will pay an additional percent of income. The major types of healthcare finance, like we mentioned, that including both the private one and the, the public one. The, the four main types of financing methods are insurance premiums, 
income taxes, sales taxes, payroll taxes, of course, you know, the patient themselves, the out of pocket, we already mentioned. Payment mechanisms. Well, historically in this country, the healthcare system has been a production-based system, receiving compensation for service produced. What does that mean? That means historically, hospitals, physicians are paid by how many, how many dollars they charged. They just say, okay, I'm gonna charge this much, I'm gonna charge that much for different services. And then insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid are gonna pay for that. Well, this created an incentive for providers, both physicians and hospitals want to produce as more as possible because the more they provide, the more they're gonna, the more payment they're gonna get. So it also creates the biggest problem because the US saw a huge dramatic increase of cost and healthcare spending. Especially after 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid were established to help the elderly and the poor, and the low-income families. So insurance companies and also the government realized how important to have some control instead of just isolate the production, like the hospitals and the physicians and the insurance part. So look at this, the Medicare, the public health insurance program, mainly for the elderly, try to encourage their, their beneficiaries to enroll in a managed care company. This is what we mentioned, part, Medicare part C, meaning, well, if you guys want to reduce cost, you could really join a private managed care company, either HMO or PPO. Join these managed care companies, meaning you will have a limited provider list. You cannot, you may not be able to see the doctor that you see for your whole life, but in return, you're gonna get uh, low cost, low cost of care. So that's, you can see the trend right now in 2019, already 35% of Medicare beneficiaries joined the managed care, and this number will in increase to 39% in 2021, and soon uh, will be more than 50% of Medicare beneficiaries will join the managed care. Same with the Medicaid, the public health insurance program for the, for the low-income families, more now more than almost 83% of Medicaid beneficiaries enrolled in managed care. So Dr. Zhao just talked about our, what our mechanism is currently, which is uh, basically fee-based or production-based. Uh, what has now been introduced to try to change that behavior is what's called pay for performance. Well, what does pay for performance mean? Well, instead of just paying you on cost-based or what you charge, we provide incentives to improve the quality of care and depending on whether you use the modalities properly, either overuse or if you underuse even, you get a penalty. So if you use it properly, then you get actually an additional incentive. So pay performance to uh, offer an incentive to encourage the health system to move from its current volume-based structure towards uh, more organizational uh, and individual behaviors. So, um, the, the goal, of course, is to increase quality and improve outcomes in the population. Uh, so the idea is to focus here on specific attributes that provide rewards or penalties that allow uh, you know, healthcare to be de delivered more efficiently. So what are these attributes? Uh, so uh, Medicare came up with a, a, a system, what they uh, term hospital value-based purchasing program. So hospitals here were rewarded or penalized based on the performance on a several domains. So these were the attributes. One was clinical processes, which we understand how the care is given, clinical outcomes, which is very important, 
Then they also started looking at patient experiences and cost efficiency came along as, as uh, Medicare went along in the, in the uh, uh, introduction of the system. So Medicare will actually withhold a percentage of inpatient uh, payments uh, to be paid to hospitals once they've determined and demonstrated that they've created value and, and, and uh, adherence to these attributes. Well, what are these attributes? So here's the weights that uh, Medicare introduced. So back, back in 2013, when the system actually took place, it was introduced a year before, but it took place in 2013 where we gathered data. And the majority of value base was based on clinical uh, process of care. And a 30% uh, was based on patient care experience. This is how they weighted the importance of those attributes and in, in pay for performance. So as years came on, the next year they introduced outcomes, which is of course very important. The next year they introduced efficiency. And then two years later, they in introduced the concept of safety. And what's happened is there's been a redistribution of waiting to determine your payment, your uh, payment for performance or incentive payment or value-based payment, uh, depending on these um, attributes. And now it's basically equal. So the four parameters that are used for Medicare are safety, patient experience, outcome, and uh, efficiency. So these are, these are all the weighted uh, appropriately. And this started in 2018 and has continued now for the last uh, four years. So the, the goal, the, they've kind of reached an equilibrium and determined that these are the most important characteristics for determining pay for performance. So the other concept that, so that was the first concept that was introduced in value-based purchasing. The second concept that's been introduced is bundle payments. Well, what's a bundle payment? Well, a bundle is something we bundle together, right? So basically they bundle a payment as a case rate uh, and it's called a case rate, a global payment, a comprehensive care payment, evidence-based case rate, uh, it has multiple terms, but most people understand this is the concept of bundling payments. So it's based on the costs expected to be incurred in a provision of a specific uh, clinical episode of care. So a patient has an uh, admit for say myocardial infarction and is in the hospital for three days uh, and has a, you know, various tests and procedures and is discharged. So the bundle payment would pay for everything that's in the patient's care for that episode of care. So the idea there is to reduce fragmentation of care and then improve quality and you get people cooperating. So the cardiologist, the internist, uh, the hospital, they all have to co coordinate and be on the same page. So that requires patients during a single uh, uh, illness or course of disease are defined across providers and settings. It doesn't matter, as I said, it's the hospital, the doctor, it doesn't matter. They all have to work together. So once uh, required services are defined, a target price is established for the bundle. And Medicare is actually defined for certain episodes by, by severity and complexity of patient's condition, what that bundle payment will be. And so this reflects the amount of payment that would pay for that care for all the services provided under that episode of care. Another concept that's been introduced to try to uh, change our financing of healthcare is a patient-centered medical home. Now this seems like a physical place, right? A home is a physical place. Well, it's not a physical place. It's really a patient-centric place. So the idea is to really keep the patient at home, uh, but it's the patient's a, a critical uh, element of this concept, the patient's engaged. And we've had a lot of issues with uh, patients in the US uh, with chronic healthcare diseases not being engaged with their provider. Uh, so this, uh, uh, encourages a very strong patient provider relationship using a team approach across multiple areas of care and continuity of care. So they basically assign a primary physician who's responsible for all their care. And they're responsible for reducing duplication of tests, procedures, emergency room visit, hospitalizations, basically keep that patient out of the hospital and also give care that's appropriate and in and, and, um, uh, maintaining the the value of the care is appropriate. So it's giving good care with, uh, with hopefully a decreased cost. So uh, national health expenditure for health services applies by different category. We can compare uh, 40 years ago in 1980 and today, more two years ago in 2019. 
look at the hospital care. 40 years ago, it was like 43%, reduced to only 31%. Well, physician and clinical service didn't change that much, keep maintaining about 20%. Another big change we could see is the uh, nursing home care. They didn't mention here, but nursing care will reduce significantly in the future. And another part is the pharmaceutical uh, prescription drugs. 40 years ago was only about 5% and today was nine or even 10%. So we can see the changes. Well, here's the prediction of the national health expenditure for the United States. Well, the latest data now is in 2019, almost $3.8 trillion spent on healthcare. This is predicted to be increased to $6.2 trillion in 2028. So let's summarize what are the advantages and the disadvantages of the US healthcare financing system. Well, because compared to Australia and the US is a very good comparison because Australia is a single payer system. You guys mainly have Medicare, the public insurer program. Well, in the US, we have a multiple payers, both public and private. So let's talk about the advantages for the multi. Basically the, the advantage of a multi-peer system is the disadvantage of the single peer system. A multi-peer system, we have more competition here and more innovation, great ability to meet a diverse preference of the different beneficiaries. Well, people want to have care wherever they want to get and whoever they want to get. So you get plenty of freedom to choose. And then effective for low and middle income countries with weak taxation system. So that's another thing why in the United States, did not work that well. The disadvantages include the high administrative cost because we have so many different private health insurance companies. We also have so many different public insurance programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and military, and they all have incurred administrative costs. Of course, adverse selection, risk selection, small distribution function, if any, and small and unstable risk pools because each program is for a segment of population. And a weak purchasing power, of course, because you only can represent this segment of the market and the people. Well, government has weak control over total health expenditures. Well, on the other hand, the single peer could have the opposite. And, you know, well, we do not need to repeat. You can read the slides. Okay, challenges and opportunities of the US healthcare system. We know the three goals of any healthcare system would be increased access, affordability, and equity. Well, we already saw in the United States, even with the Affordable Care Act of 2010, we also called Obamacare, still right now we have about 9% of the population are uninsured. This is unbelievable for any developed countries. And we already saw how the almost 18% of GDP spent on healthcare and it doubles of what uh, Australia is spending on your healthcare, high cost. And we also have a lot of inequities exist in healthcare access and outcomes by race, different ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and other dimensions. Opportunities. The five policy priorities could really help to fix some of the issues in the US healthcare system. Number one, continue expand the insurance coverage. Of course, right now, you know, because the politics, well, we'll see what is gonna happen. Number two, accelerate transition to value-based care. Dr. Perroni mentioned the value-based care uh, or the new payment uh, mechanisms. We're gonna focus more on value instead of volume. And also advanced home-based care because of the availability of technology, telehealth, telemedicine, and now made a lot of the services could be conducted at home, patient's home. It's much cheaper, low cost. 
And the fourth one, improve the affordability of drugs and other therapeutics. We all know the US has the most expensive prescription drugs in the world. And how we could fix this through uh, the, the regulation and also the government, how we could improve that. Well, quite frankly, pandemic of 2020, uh, the COVID-19 really helped a lot for this. We already saw how the vaccines immediately started to put into market. The fifth one, develop a higher value workforce. Well, there's a huge clinician shortage workforce in the healthcare field in the United States. And how we can fix this in terms of the regulation and in terms of the, all the um, credentials would be really helpful. So do we want to proceed with some questions? Yes, I think we can. I would, like, are... to show the, uh, I would like to show the uh, table first. Just a second. Oh, okay. Stop the share screen. Uh, yeah, I think, Dr. Perion, you have the tables, right? The next slide. There yeah, are. Yep, yes. Yep, yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, the question is, is in relation to the table that I showed here, um, the, the Commonwealth Fund report was out um, in uh, early this month. It compares the US health system uh, with another 10 high income countries uh, using 71 indicators um, grouped into five different domains that uh, you can see on the left hand side of the table. And you can see that the report indicates that the overall performance of the health system, health, US health system is ranked the 11th means the, the bottom of the 11 country and four out of the uh, five indicator domains also rank the bottom among the 11 country. But as you say that US spends 17% of GDP on health in comparison to 10 in, in Australia and the, um, the, the dollar uh, spent on per capita is nearly double of what we spend in Australia. So uh, my question is when looking at the US health system uh, how it's organized and how it's financed. What are the major factors attributing to this in equity in healthcare access um, and also the um, healthcare outcomes, as you actually already discussed the challenges that the US is facing. Thank you. Um, if I could get the screen back, I'll uh, show some slides. Oh. Yep, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I think that's a great question. So uh, as uh, Dr. Li Hang said, uh, you know, we, uh, the US ranks last and congratulations to Australia, you're third <laughs> overall. So, so we, we've got a bit high bar to live up to here. Uh, so I would like to point out we're last in every category except care process. So we're, we're second in the world in set care process, which is how you deliver care. And we do a lot of technology. We do a lot of procedures. The care process is extensive. That's why we're expensive. So, and that is borne out in this healthcare spending as GDP, as Dr. Zhao pointed out. And this is really comparing to the rest of the 11 countries. We are by and far, far and away the, the highest uh, percent of GDP of any other country. So we're not even close to any other country. So, so, so what is going on here? So what, what is happening here? The reason for this is our financing system is different and our delivery system is different. And so what, are the, what, what is going on with our financing system? Well, our financing system is inefficient. As Dr. Zab mentioned, it's inequitable. It's, it's costly. We don't have coverage for everyone. 9% of our population or, or even probably greater don't have access, adequate access to care depending on the socioeconomic um, uh, status of the patient. And if this continues, it's really fiscally un unsustainable. We cannot have you know, 17, 18% or 20% of our GDP, which is projected in the next five years to be given to our healthcare. So, so what, is the, what is the other reason? Obviously the finance system is, is not good, but also the delivery system is not good. So that the other issue is that we're very fragmented. The, the, the healthcare is not given as a cohesive uh, system of healthcare. As you look at a single payer system like you have, you have physicians, uh, hospitals, providers, answer care su uh, support services all aligned 
and uh, on a on a, a single mechanism, we are not aligned. The the the, me the mechanism is totally fragmented, and it's often difficult for patients to even find care because it's so fragmented. Uh, it's the other th major category is we're not designed for chronic care. We are fantastic at acute care. We have great emergency rooms. We have the most MRI scanners in the world. Uh, if you have an injury or you break your bone, you can get an MRI done almost the same time or the same t uh, same uh, hour. You know, if you that you that you need it. Um, we have great technology, but it's really not designed for chronic care. And as you know, most of the cost of healthcare is for chronic patients. It's the healthcare delivery system <coughs> is also haphazard and often poor quality because of that, because of the fragmentation. And we use a lot of unproven and marginal therapies. That's really our, if it's new, it must be used. It's basically our philosophy in the US in healthcare. So if it comes out, whether it's been proven, there's studies to show it, it's used. Well, th there are some advantages, however. So you asked about the advantages and disadvantages. There's advantages of our finding system is that it's, it's employer-based, so it doesn't come out of the pocket of, of, of people. So as mentioned, the tax advantage uh, system here. So the relative cost to each person is probably lower than a national or single-payer system, uh, ultimately, because the, 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 all, although ultimately we all pay the government, but per, uh, per capita basis, and we're paying more per healthcare, but the, the net effect that the, the uh, employees seeing because of tax advantageous and also the employers, the corporations are really getting a huge tax break. So the employers are very reticent to change the system because it's a good system for them also. Uh, and, and for research, uh, we have a fairly uh, free market. So the advantage there is, and, and this is the best example is the pharmaceutical research. The, you know, a great majority of drugs come out of the United States out of research. Look at the vaccines. You know, the vaccines came quickly from the U.S. Uh, with Pfizer and Moderna, they, they were here in record time because of, uh, you know, the, our, our, uh, basically our system that allows for fr uh, market-free research. Um, the other advantage for the, uh, as far as the delivery system is that there is choice. Uh, in, in a single-payer system, you don't often have choice. You're, you're, uh, you're uh, directed to a certain pathway to take care of, here you can pretty much choose, if you're insured, you can pretty much choose any one you want. There's less bureaucracy. Uh, and the other factor that's often mentioned is the shorter wait for procedures, especially for technology procedures, there's no question, we have the shortest waiting times for most technology. Uh, the other is, uh, we talk about bad access for patients who don't have uh, insurance. Well, the opposite is very true. If you have private pay, and you have great insurance, your access is great. So there's a small segment that really gets excess access versus the, the, the there's a disparity of course, but the, 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 the people who are enjoying access, again, don't wanna change that access. So, so that they consider that to be an advantage for them, so. Did that answer your question, Dr. Yang? Yes, I think that's a really comprehensive answer. And I agree, and looking at a number of things that you mentioned, um, is also the challenges facing the Australian health system. Although the finance range, financial arrangement is different, uh, for example, the, the chronic disease management um, is, is, is a global challenge uh, to all the countries. Sure. Um, Australia has got uh, many initiatives in the past uh, decade to try to reduce the fragmentation of the healthcare provision and also encourage the uh, continuity of chronic health disease management. But we are far from the goals that we would like to achieve. And um, also one thing is we are really behind in comparison to the US is the investment in medical and health research, including uh, in pharmaceutical. So, uh, so in, in, in in the sense of adopting innovative ways of running healthcare and doing the, the uh, adopting the model to provide a service, we are not as advanced as many other uh, high income countries. So looking at the, um, how health systems finance, uh, in Australia, we use, a, as you said, we use a really simple system. We have Medicare. It provides free hospital services to all Australian citizens and, and residents and also heavily subsidized GP service. And we also have a really um, 
I think um, really important uh, initiative is the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, which under the scheme, uh, we enjoy really low cost of uh, medical treatment and, and medication that we take. Uh, but we also have a private health insurance system, which the government heavily encourage because that will uh, uh, allow the access of other non-clinical uh, services and also the long run to reduce the burden to the public, public hospital system. And, but now, but we don't have uh, employer contributing uh, insurance um, in our system. So um, do you think that you can talk a little bit about how it works and, and also what, what's the fast growing scheme that you have and, and why? Sure, so, um, so you wanna talk a little bit about our insurance health plans in the US and, and what, what's going on with that uh, here. So, so I'll, I'll start here again with um, uh, some graphs about, and one graph that uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Zhao showed in, in uh, similar terms. This is US public spending is similar to other countries. So the public spending, we talk about Medicare, we spend just about as much money as most other uh, countries um, Australia is actually on the lower end, which is which is good. You're and, and you're one of the more efficient countries we know. But if we look at our public system uh, spending, which is this dark blue here, it is very similar to uh, other uh, the top eleven countries that 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 are are noted in the comparison by the Commonwealth Fund uh, report. So we're very close to Norway, which is number one, you know, number one, uh, uh, Switzerland and Germany. So that we're pretty pretty close to that. Uh, the difference is uh, the spending in private spending and out-of-pocket spending, we are vastly outstrip any other country. Now, if you look at, there is some out-of-pocket spending in some countries because they, they allow uh, private, private spending to occur like Switzerland. Um, but, but if you look at overall, all the countries, the, the private spending is they're disproportionately higher. And this is the spending that goes by its employer base that, that Dr. Zhao talked about. The, the percentage that we have spending is the employer base versus the government public spending that we have. So we're spending all the public spending, which theoretically should take care of the whole population, but does not. It actually takes care of only a small percentage of the population. And instead, we're also spending the, pub, the private spending and out-of-pocket spending in addition to take care of the rest of the population. So, so where is this money, this private spending, uh, how is that, how is that uh, garnered or how, how does it, uh, how does the financing work? So this is the, it's a primary employer-based sponsored health insurance. We mentioned that's the majority number. And that has been traditionally has been uh, what's called just, uh, you know, fee for service uh, insurance. If you look back in uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was fee, mostly fee-for-service uh, conventional insurance. And what came along quickly was a PPO, which is a limited panel of physicians, a preferred provider organization, which allows you to only see certain physicians who have contracted and have set the rates uh, with the insurer uh, and, the, and the employer contracts with them, generally speaking. Um, also came, uh, soon came HMOs, and they really hit, very, uh, very, very popular, and actually started uh, exceeding uh, almost or, or catching up to PPOs in the uh, near the turn of the century. Um, but again, uh, because of limitation of choice of physicians, the HMO, would, would, the health maintenance organization would remit would limit the physician and hospital uh, uh, choice to, uh, remarkably. It was a much smaller panel than a preferred pr provider organization. And so uh, patients basically didn't like that. And that's one about the thing America likes is choice. And so they didn't like that. And although they are hang around, it's become the minority of choice of um, the plans that we have. What's caught on more so is this um, uh, tan um, um, bar graph, proportion of the bar graph that you see that's dramatically increased, especially in the last uh, few years. And then if they carry this curve out actually to 19, it even is even more, uh, it is composing or, or almost uh, 25 to 30% of all the uh, employer insurance plans. And this is the, the plan that, that's called high deductible health plan, HDHP. And then uh, this is a slash called savings option. Well, Americans have kind of fallen in love with this kind of option. 
because there's two, way, two reasons. First, first, they think about, well, as high deductible means you have to pay more out of your pocket. Well, you do, but there's a, there's a caveat. So the, the, the deal is if you don't spend it, you can actually pocket the money in a tax-free account. So you can actually use that money if you don't spend it in what's called a savings account or a health IRA or um, um, a health savings account, uh, HSA. And um, so you can actually keep that money and it's yours. The employer doesn't keep it. The government doesn't keep it. It's yours. So young people, generally speaking, who are working and have an employee-sponsored plan and are not during getting sick. So they don't even use their whole deductible. They can pocket that deductible. It's amazing. So they just keep that money. You can just put a savings account. It's tax-free. So, and you can use it for anything else you want in the future. So you can actually take it out and use it for other things uh, as well as health-related health needs. So this is why it's caught on popularity. And the employers love it because the plan is cheaper, because the insurers will give you a less premium because you're using a high deductible. So you're almost asking the patient themselves to decide and say, maybe I don't need this care. I only go when I'm sick. You know, I don't need the extra MRI today. I can wait and get the reasonable one at the reasonable facility that, that my plan has directed uh, for me. So the, the consumer and the patient is making a, a, a wise decision in the process, not just the insurer or the, or the provider. Uh, of course, I, I want to add a few things. Of course, for the yeah. HDHB plan, the, the young, healthy people want to use this one. Number one, lower premium or high deductible. They could choose not to go to see the doctor. They just say, okay, I'll wait two, three, two to three days out just to recover. So the criticism is also, what if for the really old, I mean, the old and sick people, if they cannot, uh, you know, number one, the high deductible, it's really high, still costly. Number two, what if they have a family? So, so that's, and uh, what if they want to purposely postpone their disease, their treatments, their diagnosis, so they would get more serious in the future uh, or severe in the future. So that's the, um, some of the criticism we received for the HDHP. But uh, Either way, it's getting more and more um, options, like the HDA to be soon to be over 50% in a few years. So what, they, what the insurers have come back with, and Dr. Zhao is absolutely right, but they, they, they basically allowed preventive care to be free. So you can have an annual physical yes. still free. You can get mammography if you're qualified. It's still free. doesn't count to your deductible it's all included, it doesn't count toward your deductible. So, so there are certain basic procedures that are included in the high deductible plan and without the deductible even coming in. It's a zero, it's a zero deductible versus those kind of common things to not to encourage people not to get care. That wasn't the intent here. The idea is to be get responsible care and shop around for the best price, right? So if, if the MRI costs uh, at uh, facility A costs $1,000, and uh, you have to pay a thousand out of your pocket versus it costs $500 and you have to get it, wait till tomorrow to get it. Is that okay? Of course it's okay, probably unless it's uh, obviously urgent. So, uh, so you can save $500 and the consumer makes that choice. They start asking questions. In the past, most consumers have not even known what the price is. We don't know what the price of healthcare is. Nobody asks because the insurance pays for it anyway. So the answer would be, oh, your insurance will cover it. Don't worry about it. You know, so, but now we have to worry about it because it comes out of our pocket. So. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for the great um, presentation. Um, I was going to ask you a question and then Dr. Zhao just partially answered that. I think it, uh, it is a great initiative um, that there's no single funding model will have all the benefits and all the advantages. There's always disadvantage and, and advantages. But I think most importantly, how I see from the US system point of view is how to make sure the poor won't become poor under these arrangements and how those disadvantaged people can have fair access and enjoy the fair health outcomes as the rest of the population. But this is still the same similar challenge to us when we can reach, reach, the, reach the gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and also a general um, Australian population. Um, 
And, but we are looking at the system now. So we are doing well and we're doing better than you, but it doesn't mean in 20, 30 years time that we are still ahead of you because we are using a single tech based on heavily based on our individual tech system to finance the health system. I don't, I don't think the government can increasingly just raise the tax rate in order to fund the healthcare system. I think we are we have a lot of challenges ahead. It's how to actually meet the growing needs of the population and then how to really fund it in a innovative way in meeting those demands. And I think Chris has got a question for you as well. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It's been very insightful. Um, I think so far we've focused on the situation now and also talked about you know, what's ahead. But um, one question I did have was, I think it could be good to sort of take a, I guess, a step back in time. And um, I was just curious at how the, the employer-sponsored health insurance um, originated. Like, where did it come from and how did it come to become such a large component of the US health system? Um. So I think, uh, you know, all of this, is, as you know, is historical. So the U.S. healthcare system primarily was um, a fee for service. It's traditionally been, and if you look at the historically, it's been for most countries also for fee for service. I, you go to the doctor, you pay cash, right? Uh, and that's, that's the way system has been. What but the evolution, what happened that changes, uh, changed America completely was Medicare. So when Medicare came into being, uh, there was coverage for senior citizens, which there was qualifying was age 65 or over, uh, and you had to follow it, but also satisfy other criteria. You know, you had to pay into it and be qualified. Uh, but it basically allowed for coverage for Medicare, and so the the basically this the the idea became, well, what happens to the rest of the population? So private insurance came into being. And private insurance, the cost of it was um, uh, um, significant. Uh, so uh, although it was offered directly to um, you know uh, individuals, what people found was if you get in a group, and the insurers also found that if they could get a group together and reduce risk. So the idea of community risk came into being. So when early early insurance was uh, placed. Uh, the idea was to get community risk or community rating. I.e., you cover everybody in the community so you don't have adverse selection. You know, you don't have to get the sickest person. And what happens uh, often is that insurance used to select on not include pre existing patients or pre existing conditions. So, but the idea started with community risk and so that the, the premium would be lower for everyone. Well, in order to do that, to ensure everyone, the, the easiest way to do that was to get employers to help uh, cover, you know, offer it to employers and they would offer to employees instead of negotiating with each single individual. And then the government said, well, that's a great idea. I think we'll actually encourage you to do it. And the, our government, the way they encourages everything to be done, it gives you a tax break. Uh, and that seems to work. And it's a, it's a very economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, driven uh, process. And so they decide, well, we'll give you a tax break. And when that corporations heard that, say, well, we can give you a, we get a tax break ourselves. The, the, uh, you know, our uh, employees get a tax break, and we get cheaper premiums for everybody. It's a win-win. Why not do it? So that's how how the system really started. And then we had uh, the the systems were not for profit. So the all the early insurers were the Florida Blue System or the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield system. In Florida, we had the Florida Blue System, but we had Blue Cross Blue Shield all over the country. They were not for profit. And they, uh, they came together just for the purpose of, of offering insurance to basically the whole community. And again, it was supposed to be that we offered insurance to the rest of the community. Un unfortunately, what happened, or fortunately, whichever way you wanna look at it from the other insurance companies, uh, for profit uh, companies got into it also and started offering competing uh, insurance uh, products and saying our products better or even cheaper, we can beat these uh, rates. And that's free enterprise in America. America has always been, this is a free healthcare system. And so that's something we haven't let go of yet. It's a capitalistic system, even in healthcare. 
And, and that becomes uh, a fundamental question is, is healthcare really an extra now, or is it a fundamental right you know, to, to have healthcare? And that debate is still not settled in America. Uh, there's parties on both sides that say, well, uh, it's a you know, privilege you need to pay for it. It's not a right that any, everybody has uh, and that it needs to be assured by the federal government. As I said, it's not been, uh, that debate is still ongoing. And, and certainly in our healthcare field, most of us feel you know, that it is, uh, healthcare is a basic human right that must, must be tender to everyone and, and fairly in an equal and equitable way. Uh, but that debate has not uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, by any means been resolved in the United States. So. Chris, uh, well, on top of what Dr. Perrion has been uh, seeing, I think another, the history of the employer-based health insurance really started in 1940s, right after World War II. Well, remember, well, you, were, you and I were not born yet. So basically by then, the US sent most of the men to Europe to fight. And then all the local companies, the private companies, they were in desperate need for workers. So right after World War II, these people came back to the United States and then the the, insurance, the, the the employers try to hire the most qualified workers and what kind of benefit packages they could attract these workers. So when we they found, okay, if I offer free, I mean, private health insurance for my employees, these people would love to come to my uh, uh, factory instead of other factories. So the government also encouraged this employer-sponsored insurance because they, they want these people from Europe come back, the military people to get jobs. They said, okay, if you guys offer health insurance, either the employee or the employer need to, neither need to pay uh, tax. So government use this tax credit. We do not charge you tax. And then employers love to use the private health insurance to attract the workers and the workers love to get this benefit also do not need to pay tax. So basically it's a three win, win, win situation. And that's what it really started. And then it started to grow after 1960s when Medicare, Medicaid, you know, all these government programs started. So. Yeah, that's so when, when Medicare came, it really took off, you know, the concept. Exactly, of yes. Medicare, so. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for the great answers. Um, I think that there's a couple of things we also need to consider is U.S. has a much larger population than the than Australian population, which means it's much complex to manage, and firstly, and secondly, that we have relatively short history in, in establishing a country, being a country, uh, sometimes you know that building things sometimes is easier than fixing things. So, um, so there are set different set of challenges. Uh, we, we can't say we are doing better than you, or you'll be doing better than us. But as cross learning is, is, I think, is critical for the growing of our healthcare system and meeting the needs. Now our interview is uh, drawing um, to the end. Um, are there any final remarks from anybody before we um, close the uh, session? Dr. Liang, well, that's a great uh, that that's a great comment you made. So we're here to learn from your system and hopefully bring it back to America, and we can hopefully give you some pointers on what we're doing. Maybe that would be helpful. So we we love this exchange between Australia and America. So we, thank you very yes, much. Yes, uh, we uh, on behalf of UNF University of North Florida, we would love to invite both of you guys and your colleagues and your students to visit University of North Florida in the United States. Welcome. Thank you very much for the kind offer. Yeah, so um, I, I'm sure the student would love to meet with you sometime. It's just a, because of time, time difference and make it really hard. This is a time that when the student going to work, <laughs> so it's impossible they actually come to the session, but I'm sure they will watch the, um, the presentation interview and then we'll get benefit from this kind of um, exchange and activities. Um, Chris, anything else from you? Uh, no, no more questions for me, but I just want to reiterate again, like, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very good. Thank you, thank you very much for everybody. And I'm, I will organize another interaction again soon. Thank you. Have a good thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.